Soccer is a funny career. And when I say that my teammates and I have been training our entire lives for a World Cup, I mean it literally. From five until 26 is the amount of time I spent toiling to be ready for that summer. That's like three quarters, more than three quarters of my life spent preparing for that moment in the summer of 2015. And if you remember back, we did not start out that well. It was a bit rocky, but we did well enough to put ourselves in a really good spot in the knockout round. So into the knockout round we go, and suddenly it clicked, and we played better and better and better until we reached the final. And arguably, we were playing some of the very best soccer that the U.S. Women's National Team had played in years. Now, we were playing so well, in fact, that if you turned on the TV just six minutes late, I don't know why you would, but if you did, <laughs> you already missed two goals, two USA goals. And if you turned on the TV 16 minutes late, you missed four. We, <laughs> well, I didn't score them, but I had passes to people that scored, so. <laughs> we were flying. We ended up winning five to two against Japan. And thank you, thank you. Um, this is one of the very best moments of your life. It's like the culmination of your life and career goals and aspirations and dreams all coming together in one moment. That's it. Yeah. And you're standing on this podium and you're crying and you're laughing and you're hugging your teammates and you're screaming and there's confetti falling down, okay? And so you're so joyful. It's actually so, there's like so much feeling that you can't even describe how it is. And as I'm standing up there, I'm looking around, I'm celebrating with my teammates and I'm thinking, something feels off. And I didn't know what it was at the time. But then, in the couple months that I got to reflect afterwards, I realized that media rights holders, FIFA, sponsors, federations, clubs, were all generating value off of our win, but we were unable to. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't. We didn't have the infrastructure. We didn't have the know-how, the human capital. We didn't have the resources. We had nothing. Picture this, the most famous women in all of America in the summer of 2015, not being able to financially capitalize off their own hard work, honing their craft since they were five years old. Needless to say, this was really fucking upsetting. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. I was told I'd get one F-bomb, so I had to use it. So anyways, I decided, okay, I never want this to happen again. How can I make a change? So I started to really dig in, because soccer means the world to me. It's the world's game, and it's called the beautiful game for a reason. Anybody, no matter your age, your gender identity, no matter where you come from, what color you are, what religion you practice, your socioeconomic status, it doesn't matter who you are, as long as you have a body and a soccer ball, you can play. There's so much beauty in that simplicity. This is why I love the game. But the beautiful game also has an ugly side. Soccer has a lot of inequalities that happen on a very deep level. I'm sure many of you have seen or felt inequality in your own workplace. It's ubiquitous. The difference is, in soccer, that it happens on a very deep and very public level. Because soccer is watched worldwide, we're able to study that inequality. Journalists are scrutinizing the finances of FIFA and federations and clubs, and it gives us ample opportunity to study the difference between men's soccer and other. And I put women's soccer, Paralympic, Olympic, uh, excuse me, Special Olympics, uh, futsal, beach soccer, anything that isn't men's soccer in other. And the only difference between men's soccer and this category is of other 
is that it's different. And because it's different, there are inequalities. So now I'd like to pose a question that I want everybody in the audience to please think about as I'm going through my talk. And that question is, can't different be beautiful all on its own? Just think about that a bit as I'm going through, because I'm gonna keep coming back to it, okay? So what is the inequality? I'm sure you're asking, okay, you said there's inequality, but you haven't put a face to it. I'm only gonna talk about inequality in women's soccer because I live it and I know it. There are certain barriers that women's soccer players have to overcome to be able to participate in the sport that they love. We have individual barriers, and we also have systemic barriers. Some of the individual barriers include barriers to entry, such as a cultural machismo, okay? Women aren't supposed to play the game. There are barriers to continue. Last year in the NWSL, the US Women's Professional League, the lowest salary was $17,000. And barriers to being considered a legitimate professional. Playing soccer in the morning, and then hustling at night to keep the lights on. That's what it takes to be an appropriately compensated human outside of the US Women's National Team. And then, if you get past all of those individual barriers and you figure you still wanna play, you have systemic barriers that we all have to face together. Women have to force FIFA, federations, and their clubs to do what's right. They have to, women have to prove their economic worth and value to these naysayers all by themselves. It's like women's soccer is stuck in this catch-22. Women have to prove that they are worthwhile investing in, but at the same time, there's no initial investment to be able to prove financial feasibility. It's a mouthful, that's why I need to write it out. <laughs> but it's true. So that leads me to the question. Does women's soccer deserve fair compensation and fair treatment according to the revenues, which are much less than men's soccer? Is this an easy question, or is it more complicated than that? And I'm sure you can guess that it's more complicated than that, otherwise they wouldn't have given me a TED Talk. <laughs> By the way, this is so my favorite question. I get it all the time, and oftentimes it happens when people think that they're like, got her. <laughs> like, they think that I won't have an answer to this. Um, but I do. And this is what I say. I say, I understand economics. I was a business major at UNC, and I've started my own company. Thank you. I wasn't looking for the claps there, but I'll take it. The beautiful game for men has been monetized over hundreds of years with billions of dollars of investment. It's not only a disservice to the women's game to ask it to produce the same amount of revenues, in 10 years of being semi-professional, it's also completely unrealistic. How can the women's game possibly produce the same amount of revenues when the investment is so much less? If you take a look at FIFA's annual budget, they come out with a, with a financial report every year. Take a look in 2018, you'll find a development fund. It is a fund with between $1 billion and $2 billion in it. And if you read down the line items, you'll eventually find women's football. And what you'll see is that it accounts for 1.4% of that budget that goes towards developing the game around the world. That's not even including FIFA's entire budget. This is like asking a tricycle to keep up with a NASCAR. It would be funny if it wasn't so true, right? So, what do we do? How do we move forward? What's the answers? This is important. Not just for women in soccer, but for women in general. Equal investment leads to economic equality, which in turn will lead to equality. And women's soccer is ripe for investment, which is in stark contrast with the men's game. The men's game is tapped out. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, record transfer fees are being set on the men's side. Okay, for all you non-soccer junkies like me, essentially that's like a buyout clause in a player's contract, 
so they can play on a different team. So for example, in 2017, Neymar, a very famous male Brazilian soccer player, wanted to transfer from Barcelona to Paris Saint-Germain. Just so he could play on a different team, Paris Saint-Germain had to pay Barcelona $263 million. Yeah, it's expensive. I could probably run my league for like 17 years. <laughs> and oftentimes, due to these financial burdens, teams will run into troubles, just trying to field a competitive squad. Manchester United is one of the most valuable and visible clubs in the world. But they're currently running up a $479 million debt that has been increasing for the last five years. By the way, this is in total opposition to the women's game. The women's game has so much potential. People are interested and they're willing to watch. Just this past summer, TV records were shattered across the globe, people tuning in to see the Women's World Cup. 1.1 billion people watched throughout the course of June and July. Yes. And not only that, 82 million people, on average, tuned in to watch the USA beat Netherlands in the World Cup final. Yeah. And just for some perspective, that is four times the amount, either the 2019 NBA Finals or the 2019 World Series. Four times. The only other sport that comes close to this that's in that stratosphere is the NFL. But their viewing numbers have been decreasing for the past couple of years. So how the heck do we tap this interest? What do we do? Let's treat it like a startup. Startups are about finding untapped markets and leveraging innovative strategies and ideas to generate value and create revenue. Sounds like a fit, huh? So that brings me back to my point, my question that I said earlier. Can't different be beautiful all on its own? The women's game is never going to be the same as the men's game. Women are never going to run as fast, kick as hard, or flop on the ground and cry as much as men do. <laughs> but why do they have to? The game is just as interesting without the same amount of testosterone. We need to be able to find the, find the beauty in the women's game and revere it for what it is. Excellence. Now that being said, if we want people to embrace these differences, then we must make the case for, we need to market these differences to be seen as much must watch entertainment. Instead of hiring people that can't cut it in the big five leagues, let's insert entrepreneurs. Women's game has quality on the pitch and has distinct qualities off of it that the men's game does not. So let's market those. Well, what are they? Well, our players are more than soccer. Not to say the dudes aren't, but due to the financial limitations of being a female in sport, the byproduct is that we go to college. <laughs> I didn't mean that in a negative way. <laughs> and oftentimes, because we're pretty kick-ass at soccer, we're afforded opportunities to go to amazing universities like Harvard, Stanford, and of course, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. <laughs> Tar. Nobody? Okay. <laughs> I guess it only works in North Carolina. And even if our players don't go to university, they still develop resourcefulness and important skill sets due to the financial limitations of the system. Many of our players commentate, coach, they start their own businesses, they work a second job during their careers. We must use this. Can you imagine if reporters asked us insightful, thought-provoking, and interesting questions? It's kind of easy, actually. You'd get insightful, thought-provoking, and interesting answers in return. And when you have interesting answers and interesting players, then you have an interesting league. Let's build it around these personalities because we have plenty. Let the audience get to know us. 
Second, let's use our culture as the example. It's no secret that the men's game has serious issues with homophobia, racism, and sexism. Although the women's game has had brushes with these types of things in the past, the field is filled with out queer spectrum women from all over the world in every color. We, <laughs> yeah. The women that play are pretty brave. And we have been marginalized and discriminated against by the hierarchy of soccer. So we want to make sure that our games are welcoming for anybody that is respectful and wants to watch quality entertainment. You can come to our games and know that you're safe. Let our culture be the example that the men's game holds on a pedestal. And finally, probably the most important point because investors are always looking for returns, small is an opportunity for growth and building. Established leagues have a hard time changing due to deep-rooted norms, red tape, among other things. The interesting thing about startups is that they're small and nimble and can pivot on the fly. You can make the league into anything you want it to be. Not only can you create a league that generates revenue and value, but it also breaks down barriers and creates opportunities. You can ask questions that other leagues did not dare to ask. Like, how do we appropriately compensate our players now for the future financial success of the league that they don't get to participate in because they've retired or because they're injured? How do we keep their brains safe? Do they get equity? Do fans get to buy shares and literally invest in their favorite team's success? How do we make the game more interactive for the fans so it's more entertaining? I don't know the answers to these questions, but I do know this. If we answer them and answer them well, that women's soccer is more than a worthwhile investment. So to finish up, I'd like to come back to that question that I keep asking, but this time I want to put in one more word, and please take it home with you and think about it. Can't different be beautiful and valuable all on its own? Thank you so much. Thank you.